Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Science Pub. My name is Nathan Moses, the Associate Director of Events and Engagement at the OSU Cascades campus here in Bend, Oregon. Not only do we have a fantastic event tonight, but it falls on a special date in our country, Monday, October 11th, 2021, Indigenous Peoples Day, and the first official recognition of this day for the state of Oregon. Let us continue to recognize and honor the many indigenous peoples of our country, their resilience and their contributions to our history. Let us continue to educate ourselves and join OSU in staying committed to continually advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice on its campuses and beyond. We are thankful that once again, we get the opportunity to spend time with one of the great academic minds at Oregon State University during our program this evening. And I have a feeling that tonight's presentation will have a pretty ranging appeal for our audience members. We are privileged tonight to be able to hear from Dr. Jose Antonio Orozco, representing OSU's School of History, Philosophy, and Religion as he presents to us, To Boldly Go, Why Scientists and Social Justice Warriors Need Star Trek. Before we get to our program tonight, uh, we have an upcoming event to remind you about uh, that we won't wanna miss registering for. We had a fantastic number of registrations for our last event uh, last Wednesday featuring social justice advocate, um, I'm sorry, ad activist, Tamika Mallory. And next up, we bring to you on November 3rd, Reckoning with Race and Racism in America with Michael Eric Dyson. You're invited to a special evening with Michael Eric Dyson, a leader on race, religion, and contemporary culture to explore our nation's challenges as our communities and society reckon with social justice. Explore the culture and social forces that have shaped our nation's approach to issues of race. Dyson will trace the genealogy of anti-Blackness from the slave ship to the street corner where Floyd lost his life and where America gained its will to confront the ugly truth of systematic racism. All right, and like all science pubs in our virtual events, um, the presentations are fantastic, but that's only half of the show. We want to hear from you. Participants for tonight's Science Pub may submit questions for our presenter via the YouTube live chats or via the Mentimeter app found at www.menti.com. Um, you're going to use event code 22571005. You'll see that on the screen right now. You can use that QR code uh, to actually use your mobile devices, take a picture of that and a link up to the QR code, or just go to menti.com or download the app free of charge. If there's any uh, questions that are not answered tonight simply because we can't get to everything, please email events at osucascades.edu and we'll be sure that we get those uh, answered for you if we can. All right, and we will have the event code up uh, at the bottom of the screen for the, for the presentation. So if you need that, uh, you will find that information there. Okay, enough from me. So let's get to the star of tonight's presentation. Dr. Orozco joined the OSU faculty in fall of 2001. He received his PhD and MA in philosophy from the University of California, Riverside, and his BA in philosophy from Reed College in Portland, Oregon. His primary area of interest is in social and political philosophy, particularly democratic theory and global justice. He teaches classes in American philosophy and Latino, Latina, and Latin American thought with an emphasis on Mexican culture history and immigration to the United States. Orozco is the academic advisor for the undergraduate peace studies program and teaches about issues of peace and nonviolence. Orozco is the author of the forthcoming book, Star Trek's Philosophy of Peace and Justice to be published by Bloomsbury Press in February of 2022. So we've got a very exciting date for him coming up in just a few short months. Uh, we're privileged to have him here with us tonight, and I know this will be a presentation in which we'll boldly go where no one has gone before, well, at least during a science pub. I introduce you all to Dr. Jose Antonio Orozco. Well, uh, thanks, Nathan. I really appreciate the introduction. Let me say thank you to all the folks over at OSU Cascades for all their help in getting this together. Thanks, Nathan, for the great introduction. Uh, thanks to uh, folks here in events, Shelly Signs, for asking me to get involved in all of this. I'm really, really excited to be here this evening to be able to share with you a little bit of the stuff that I've been thinking about uh, over the past year and a half or so. Uh, about how Star Trek can help us think about managing and moving through various kinds of crises that we are experiencing in the world. So for about five years or so, I've been teaching a class at OSU, which is uh, an attempt to try to introduce ethical and political theory to OSU undergraduates. And I started using Star Trek as a way to be able to help illustrate some of the issues. 
But as I started uh, uh, thinking about this, uh, the, the ways in which we were talking about Star Trek, I started to realize that Star Trek was more than just a way to sort of illustrate problems, but that there was a kind of philosophy behind the way that Star Trek approached the world. And so I have been a lifelong Star Trek fan. I uh, have been watching Star Trek ever since I was a little kid. It's always been something that's been meaningful to me. Uh, I, in fact, got married in a Star Trek uniform. That's how geeky I am. Uh, but I started to think this, there's something seriously uh, uh, important here in terms of the way that Star Trek approaches the world. And so I started to think about this question about how might Star Trek help us think about our future? future. And so what I want to share with you this evening then is this, uh, these, these ideas that I've been processing and thinking about in terms of the way in which Star Trek can help us to think about the present moment that we're in, which is a moment of numerous crises and where many people are worried about what our future might look like. So let me share some, some um, thoughts with you in terms of um, some slides. So uh, I've done uh, versions of this talk before, and a lot of this is going to be stuff that is distilled in my, in my book. But I've talked about these ideas to many different audiences in academic conferences, uh, and also at different comic cons and uh, places where people uh, like me nerdily get dressed up. Uh, and I found that there's a real hunger in talking about the, 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 these particular kinds of issues and the way that Star Trek can be helpful for thinking about how we can transform our world for a better, uh, a better future. Um, and I think that what started getting me thinking about this was this fact that in the last 10 years or so in pop culture, globally speaking, all around the world, there has been a real prevalence of dystopian imagery, dystopian stories of worlds gone wrong in which technology becomes not a friend, but as a foe, where political forces become authoritarian, uh, where, uh, as we've seen in one of the most recent iterations of the Squid Game, which is number one in almost all Netflix markets, right, these kinds of worries that social problems of debt are are going to lead to crises periods in our lives. And I think that, you know, you can see this going in, in film and television, but in the past, say, five years or so, there's also been a, a proliferation of dystopian novels. So starting in 2016, George Orwell's 1984 became a bestseller once again. And so people were really plumbing and looking for these stories that are talking about the kinds of worst sorts of uh, examples uh, of, of, of a possible future. And so I was really kind of curious as to why it is the case that these sorts of stories are so popular today. What's going on that people are attracted to the kinds of uh, uh, grim images that are being portrayed in pop culture? And the reality is, is that there's not a lot of hope to go around. So uh, in an international survey that uh, just came out uh, last month, uh, the survey was done earlier this year of 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25 uh, in about 10 different countries, including the United States. 75% of the young people uh, that were surveyed agreed with this statement. The future is frightening. 60% of the youth from the United States agreed with that. 56% of the international youth agreed that humanity is doomed. 46% in the United States. 83% of the uh, young people agreed, people have failed to protect the planet. And that was 78% in the United States. So there's a lot of feeling, I think, amongst really young folk today that the future is not something that they can have hope for uh, uh, a good life in. And that, that, in fact, right, humanity is on the wrong path in a really severe kind of way. There's not a lot of faith or trust in our leaders either. In that same trust, in that same uh, survey, 58% of the international uh, uh, young people believe that governments are betraying me and future generations. That was true of 56% of the young people in the United States. 33% of them believe that, uh, that governments are protecting me, the planet, and future generations. So that means that almost two thirds of young people around the world believe that their governments are not doing anything to protect them or their futures. And that was true of 25% of the youth surveyed in the United States. 
Only 31% believe that governments can be trusted. And that's even lower in the United States. Only 21% of the US young people surveyed believe that the government can be trusted. And an overwhelming majority believe that governments are lying about the impact of actions taken to mitigate things like global climate change. 62% of the United States believe that. So this is a, a really broad-based global survey suggesting that young people are not very hopeful about the future. And they feel that people who are in power to do something about it are not doing so, and in fact, are lying and making the situation worse. So young people don't have a lot of hope for the future. Um, you see this kind of reflected in other surveys. This is a survey that was done earlier this year as well uh, at, uh, in North Dakota of about 1,000 college students in the United States. Based on what you have learned so far in, uh, in college, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the United States? Uh, a good 42% are pessimistic about the future of the United States. Only about 24% are optimistic that the future of the United States is a good one. This is true all across different political spectrums. Liberal, conservative, and independent students all indicate similar feelings that they are pessimistic about the future of the United States. Most students are unsure about the impact that they can have in, uh, in their lives in the future. So a question was asked of these students based on what you have learned so far in college. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about your ability to make a difference in the world? And so again here, uh, uh, there's a, a sense that less than half of students uh, in the United States believe that they can make a difference in the world. A lot of people are unsure. Some people have a feeling that they can do so, but they're uh, in the minority. Most people are either unsure or pessimistic. And again, this is uh, relatively true across the board for different political uh, affiliations. So widespread feeling of powerlessness, out of being out of control. Um, Interestingly enough, it was asked, do you feel that college has given you the tools necessary for being able to solve problems that you think are important in the world? And uh, a very, uh, you know, small number of people thought that, but, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, still, again, less than half of students believe that the education that they're getting in college is something that is preparing them to make a difference in the world today. Uh, a lot of people are feeling that college may not be giving them the tools that they need to be able to think and imagine solutions to the problems that we face. Uh, and this is true, especially of conservative leaning students. Uh, uh, liberal leaning students tend to be feel that uh, they are getting the kind of uh, tools necessary in college, but uh, conservative students are not. And this follows, of course, various other opinion surveys that we have seen where uh, uh, conservatives uh, are, are questioning whether or not college education is worthwhile, uh, whether it's preparing students for a bright future. But uh, even though uh, conservative leaning folk are less likely to believe so, it's still not clear that there's wide consensus that college education is helping young people to be able to think about the future. But what's interesting too, in addition to a lot of this kind of sort of grim hopelessness and malaise and feeling out of control is that another poll done in uh, 2019 by uh, the Harris uh, group showed that when you ask young people up in the United States about the kinds of political policies that they would be willing to endorse young people and including up to uh, millennials. Uh, these are now folks in uh, uh, their 30s, some approaching their early 40s. Some people are willing to consider really radical changes to American social institutions, things like they're willing to support universal health care, tuition free college, uh, even uh, to the question of whether or not they would prefer living in a socialist country to a capitalist economy. There's a lot more of this kind of support for some radical changes in the United States than other generations, Gen X boomers and so forth. And so while there's not a lot of hope, there's a lot of people who are really interested in big changes 
in the United States. And uh, uh, finally, in, uh, the last poll that I'll share with you, this is uh, from uh, uh, Tulane University, uh, young uh, folks who were surveyed after the 2016 and 2018 elections. What you see here is large numbers of people saying that they're quote, concerned about the values of the American people. Uh, a majority of them say that they're losing faith in American democracy. Uh, in this poll, you see some description of some hope that things will get better after the 2018 elections. But right, you see here a lot of mixed feelings about what the direction of the country is and whether or not there's anything to have hope for in this world. And so when you put a lot of this kind of information together, it seemed to me to make sense why young people particularly were attracted to stories in pop culture that were emphasizing worlds of dystopia, worlds where there's authoritarian governments with leaders that you can't trust, where everyone is on their own, where there's violence, where there's despair, and where there's a few good people hanging on, uh, but it's hard to find them. I think that those stories are popular because for a lot of young people today, that's their reality. So what I was interested in then is thinking about the genre of stories that a lot of these dystopias are coming from, science fiction, which is a realm that I really appreciate a lot. And I wanted to sort of see, like, are there any kinds of utopian stories that people are latching onto, and particularly Star Trek? And so what I want to say is that I think that science fiction is a realm that we can pay attention to, that students are very interested in having some kinds of stories and having the tools necessary to be able to think about some really big problems. And I think that science fiction can be one of these places that we can turn to for this kind of opening of the imagination, for thinking about how to attain a better world and to achieve that hope that so many people are lacking. And so the question is, well, why science fiction? Why, can, why, why does this have uh, the possibility of offering these kinds of, um, uh, of gains? And here, <clears throat> when I think about science fiction, I'm really led by the work of Oregon writer Ursula K. Le Guin. And a lot of her work uh, and the way that she understands science fiction is as a genre of literature that can help us to think about how we can become wiser as individuals and how we can become wiser as human beings, as humanity. This quote I love by Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, where she writes, we read books to find out who we are, what other people are, real or imaginary, do think and feel. This is an essential guide to our understanding of what we ourselves are and may become. The literary theorist Darko Servan says that science fiction is really important in this way because unlike realistic fiction, like unlike reading something like uh, Jane Austen or Charlotte Bronte or something like that, that science fiction creates a dissonance in our minds because it presents a world that is very similar to ours in various ways, but different enough so that something is odd. And in that space of the oddness, we can begin to then think about who we are, what we believe, where we might be going. And so uh, for Darko Servan and for Ursula K. Le Guin, science fiction is a kind of tool for imagining how we might be different than we are today. In fact, she believes that uh, science fiction can be useful for helping us to imagine what a good society might look like. Ursula's fiction is very well known for being a kind of, uh, for telling stories that imagine very, very different kinds of worlds. And she goes very deep into world building, into the details of very different kinds of societies. And depending on the traditions there, she tries to explain what might be different than Earth society if a few little things were different here. And so she writes that this is an important kind of tool because it allows us to imagine different possibilities, different alternatives, and that can be useful for our own lives. She writes, we will not know our own injustice in the world today if we cannot imagine justice. We will not be free if we cannot imagine freedom. We cannot demand that anyone try to attain justice or freedom who has not had the chance to imagine them as attainable. So part of what I think science fiction can do as a tool is that it helps us, it encourages us to imagine alternative worlds that are unlike our own and 
asks us to think about what it might take to get there. And if we imagine worlds that are freer, more just, more humane than the ones that we live in today, maybe it can help us to imagine how we can change the world that we live in right now. And in fact, uh, Mae Jemison, who was here at OSU just this year earlier, talks about this too, right? She's a Trekkie. And in fact, she appeared in Star Trek, right? Uh, you see her here on uh, the shuttle Endeavor. And just a year after she led that mission, she appeared on Star Trek The Next Generation. But what she says about science fiction, I think, is very similar to what uh, Ursula K. Le Guin is saying. Uh, Jemison says, what really good science fiction does is to allow you to reflect on yourself your values, and your beliefs. And it uses a fictionalized science as a mechanism to push us to think about what we're doing. Society is influenced by technology, and the technology is influenced by society, our aspirations, and who we think we are. I think this has always been true of Star Trek. I love this meme. You see this floating around every once in a while, right? That sort of shows in the ways in which Star Trek has predicted a lot of everyday technology that we use all the way from flip phones to uh, iPads to uh, the Zoom technology that we're using today, Google Eye and all forth. Right? So Star Trek, in some sense, the writers of this have been predicting future technology that uh, we come to use in various ways, and sometimes very, very intentionally, right? The engineers at Nokia, when they first designed the very first flip phone, which you see portrayed here, they were very intentional and they said, we're designing this based on Star Trek communicators. The very first flip phone that they designed was called the Star Trek. So engineers and scientists are very, very intentional about thinking about science fiction as a guide for uh, what they do and what they design. But I think what's interesting is that it's not just in, in technology, in the STEM areas in which you see science fiction making uh, uh, an impact, one that people want to emulate. So since 2014, particularly in Asia, numerous countries that have been having protests against anti-authoritarian governments have adopted the Mockingbird Jay salute from the Hunger Games as a symbol of their protests. And so here you see protesters in Hong Kong, in Thailand, and in Myanmar, all adopting the three finger salute as a way of creating a symbol of solidarity for their movements against what they consider to be authoritarian political regimes. And one survey, in fact, by some political scientists has indicated that uh, they, what they did is they, they showed that dystopian stories have a, a real power to activate people's social imaginations, wanting them to make change. And they warn about this because they say that uh, what they did is they took a group of students, they showed them some dystopian science fiction, and then asked them about their willingness and readiness to get involved in political action. What they found was that after being uh, 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 influenced by dystopian stories, students were very interested in becoming more active. In fact, they were more willing to become active and also more willing to consider violence as a possible tactic for social change because they had been influenced by dystopian stories. And the researchers were really interested. They wanted to see whether or not it was the dystopian stories that were making them say that violence could be a possible tool or would other similar violent stories try to uh, get them to think that violence was okay. So they, try, they uh, showed them various films, Fast and Furious, something where there's a lot of action and violence, and then gave them the sort of same instrument to ask them if they were then willing to consider uh, uh, violence as a tool for social change. So violent content that was apolitical did not inspire them to think that violence was a tool that they could use. They were then just showed newsreels of protests like this, and they were asked, does this inspire you to think about using violence as a political tool for social change? Watching newsreels did not inspire students to do so. But if they showed them dystopian science fiction stories, those stories tended, in this one survey, to inspire young people to think that violence was an okay tool to use. And so these researchers are saying, we have to be very careful about the kinds of stories that we tell 
about social change because dystopian stories have a lot of social currency and power. And we see that globally going on uh, through these kinds of protests here. And so this really inspired me to think that we need to take seriously the kinds of science fiction stories that we might present as uh, tools for helping us to think about social change. Science fiction has a very powerful pool, but in some cases, this can really radicalize people in ways that perhaps uh, uh, we might not be able to contain. I want to say that Star Trek has been one of these tools that I think is a hopeful one and a helpful one. And in fact, there is a history already that Star Trek has been useful for inspiring social change. And so I want to tell a story uh, that uh, many Trekkies will know from Nichelle Nichols. Uh, this is the uh, actor that portrayed Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek, the original series in 1966. So uh, after the first season of Star Trek, the original series was coming to an end, she was feeling that maybe she wanted to take a break from this this series. She had always been a dancer on Broadway and a singer, and she was thinking that she might want to go back to do that. And so she actually went into Gene Roddenberry's office, the creator of Star Trek, and told him, I'm thinking of quitting. And Gene Roddenberry said, no, you can't do that. You can't go. Just like give it a weekend and, and tell me what you think on Monday. And she said, that's fine. That's fine. She had a, a banquet that, that weekend in Los Angeles uh, for the NAACP. And so she went to the banquet and her handlers are taking her around. And so she's sitting down to catch her breath. And one of her handlers comes up and says, uh, uh, Ms. Nichols, there's a, a fan, a Star Trek fan who would really like to meet you. Uh, would you. Would you be willing to talk with him? And she thought, oh, it's just going to be some, you know, one of the nerds. I always see these guys come around and talk with me. Uh, she said, fine, that's fine, that's fine. And so she's sitting there having a drink, smoking a cigarette. And uh, she looks up, she says, and sit, standing in front of her was Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> and Martin Luther King Jr. tells her, Ms. Nichols, I love your work. I love Star Trek. It's the only show that I let my children watch. Uh, I am such a big fan, and I'm so pleased to meet you, and I'm glad that you're doing this work. And she told him, well, that's great. Uh, you know, she was a little bit flabbergasted. Uh, here was Martin Luther King Jr., after all. And she said, but, you know, I'm thinking about leaving the show because I want to do some other things. And he told her, you can't leave. You're part of history. You're the reason we march. And what he meant by that was that, he, as, as uh, Nicole says, that he told her that she represented a future that the civil rights movement was trying to attain in the streets. She was an officer on the bridge of the enterprise. She wasn't a maid, she wasn't a criminal, she wasn't a prostitute. She was a full-fledged Starfleet officer in a role that was unlike any kind of role for African-American women in 1966. And so he said, you can't leave. My children watch you and dream that the future that you're portraying is possible. It's really important that you be where you are. And so after that, she said, well, of course I couldn't leave after that story. And I think that Star Trek has always had this kind of appeal, right? George uh, Takei, uh, who portrayed Mr. Sulu in the original series, right, talks about the vision of Star Trek as always being one of hope about having uh, 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 an affirming, shining, positive view about the future. Uh, this was something that was always part of that vision. And indeed, when I portray Star Trek, when I play Star Trek episodes for my students over the years, a lot of them have always said, this is so corny, right? This future is just so perfect. There's no problems and everyone's just doing their pew, pew, pew. I'm just like, I, I don't connect to it very much. And what I have to do then is say, yeah, that's the, that's the ideal future that uh, humanity can accomplish. But the reason that it's such a utopia is because of the backstory. And the backstory to Star Trek 200 years before Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura isn't always so rosy. And this is something that often people don't know about. Uh, this is from the, the uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, Past Tense, where uh, a couple of them go back to the 21st century in San Francisco, and uh, they go to a concentration camp for homeless and unemployed people. And uh, the episode portrays the problems of the 21st century in the United States, and Dr. Uh, Bashir here says, oh, I don't know very much about the 21st century. The history is too depressing. 
And in fact, the backstory of Star Trek leading up to what we see on screen is one that's decades full of war, nuclear destruction, genocide. World War III, according to the Star Trek timeline, is supposed to start in about 20 years from now. It will destroy about 700 million human beings on the planet. The result of that will be the post-apocalyptic horror. You see this uh, uh, depicted in Star Trek The Next Generation in the very first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, where there's it's essentially Mad Max. It's mob justice, might makes right. People are wandering around disheveled in rags, uh, inflicting awful justice on one another. And so what I often tell students is the, the sort of utopia that you see depicted there doesn't come about until April 5th, 2063, which is the day that Zephram Cochran, a wacky engineer in Montana, builds a rocket ship out of an old atomic missile uh, 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 components and uh, flies and makes it go faster than uh, light speed and attracts uh, the attention of some aliens who come down and meet him, the Vulcans. And uh, it's after this destruction, this disease, this awfulness, that there's an opening for change. And so what I think that what Star Trek portrays in all of its storyline is that there are ways in which human beings can learn how to overcome the social evils that confront us, uh, to then go on to build a kind of society in which we live in the stars amongst many different kinds of species. We defeated slavery in the United States and, and, and authoritarianism in Europe. I, this is the sort of storyline I think that comes out of Star Trek in various kinds of ways. And we have done all sorts of progress, both scientific and moral. We were able to develop faster than light speed, but also figure out the ways in which to overcome these great social problems. And that's the hope and aspiration that we can go ahead and change because we have done so in the past. Our progress is scientific and technological, but also moral. These are tied together. And I think that one of uh, our famous uh, alums agreed with this, Linus Pauling. There were many different scientists of his era, like Werner Braun and very f f different people who were always saying about science. Science is just about the truth. It's about facts. It has nothing to do with morality. And Linus Pauling always disagreed with that line of thinking. He always said, look, scientists have to involve morality in their work. Science is the search for truth, the effort to understand the world, but it's not a rejection of morality. And what he always encouraged people to think about was you have to think about the impacts of what you're researching, what you're developing, what might follow from your work. You also have to think about who might be developing things using your skills. And so I think that this led him to be a very dynamic individual in terms of his intellectualism, right? He, knew, he wins the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1954, but also the Nobel Peace Prize for his activism in 1962. He was someone who believed that human progress was something that moved and advanced together moral progress, ethical progress, along with scientific and social developments. And I have to think that part of this is because he was an avid science fiction reader. And in fact, in an interview in 1995, admitted that he tried to write some science fiction himself, and he admits he wasn't very good at it. But if you go to the Pauling archives at, on uh, the OSU campus in Corvallis, you can see his extensive collection of science fiction magazines that he had. So this was something that he was teasing his imagination to think about, to work with. And so I think that what Star Trek does is it presents various stories about the capacity of human beings to build utopia out of dystopia. And I think it's no small coincidence that the flag of the United Federations of, of Planets that was adopted on October 11th, 2161, is modeled on the flag of the United Nations. The United Nations was an attempt by human beings to come together to build a world after one of the most destructive conflicts in human history. And so I think that it's no small coincidence that the Federation was envisioned by Gene Roddenberry as this idea of taking those aspirations, those goals and those successes into space. 
And so let me just wrap up a little bit about what I think, and then we can talk about this. What are the kinds of things that Star Trek helps us to think about? And so in my book that's coming out in February, I talk about the different kinds of ways that Star Trek challenges us to think about a good society. I think that the Star Trek world challenges us to think about the role of work and wealth. Right after this uh, great quote by Jean-Luc Picard, right, the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. Well, that sounds great. How do we build a world in which people could do that? Where, was, right, so many of us, so many people around the globe, half of humanity lives in conditions of poverty that make it very difficult for them to do other than survive. In the United States, this kind of aspiration is also science fiction. But what would it mean to build a world that looks like this? I think Star Trek actually does challenge us also to think about what does it mean to build a multiracial society? Here's a variety of different characters from different series, all of them in their uh, expositions and in their storylines in the Star Trek universe are always very proud of being African American, of being uh, Native American, of being Asian, of being Latino. So the question is, what would it take to build a society in which those kinds of cultural backgrounds are resources for everybody and that make the world a better place? We still struggle in this world, in the United States, now in the aftermath of uh, the George Floyd murder, to think about how to maintain a multiracial society that's successful. So how do these people do it? What lessons can we learn from the way in which they live? I think also Star Trek helps us to think about questions of mercy, how we deal with violence, how we deal with forgiveness of the people that hurt us. How do we build different kinds of structures of living together such that we try not to harm and to punish one another, but to give grace to one another? And finally, this is one of my favorite things. I think Star Trek challenges us to think about our relationship to animals in the natural world. So in one of the chapters of my book, I explain how environmentalism has been always very important to the Star Trek universe and that evil creatures at first come then to be, come then to be important kinds of allies that we live with as human beings. And instead of thinking about animals and nature as resources for our use, they become people that we live with. And so I want to end with this, this image here. This is some production art. Uh, and this was confirmed uh, uh, canon, Star Trek canon in uh, the new uh, series, Star Trek Lower Decks, uh, of, a, uh, of a section of Federation ships that's devoted to dolphins. This was an idea that was floated in The Next Generation. Geordi LaForge mentioned it at some point, the Cestacean Ops. And uh, it was never portrayed, but it appears again in Star Trek Lower Decks. And here's some sort of conception art for that. The idea was, is that future Star Trek uh, um, uh, uh, Federation vessels would have navigation systems that would be assisted by dolphins. And so that dolphins would actually not just be entertainment or creatures for, uh, that would be uh, viewed by people in a kind of entertainment way, but that they would be crew members helping to navigate Starfleet vessels. And so I sort of think about what does it mean to think about animals in this sense as partners in our endeavors uh, in new good societies where we're trying to be just and humane, what kinds of changes would we have to have in terms of our thinking about nature and animals to achieve something like this vision of living with animals and working with animals? And so as Star Trek, you know, as, as Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry thought about all of this, the stories that he was trying to create was that there are some things that we have been able to accomplish in our history, the story of human civilization. And it's a story of being able to overcome great evils, to make progress, both technological and moral. And these are things that we should be proud of and that we should try to avoid those kinds of stories that tell us that we look for some kind of outside salvation, either from ancient astronauts or some kind of technological fix. No we can be the ones that drive human progress forward to make a better future because we have done so. And the stories of Star Trek are attempts to try to get us to be aware of the capacities that we have morally, scientifically, technologically, to be able to overcome great evils to build a hopeful future. 
And so I think that that's why Star Trek is something that we need today, both scientists and social activists, to help train our imaginations to be able to think about what kind of alternatives we might want to achieve together. And I think that at this moment in which there seems to be so little hope amongst young people, and they're searching for ways to be able to nourish that hope in them, that Star Trek can be useful by giving us characters and storylines that try to represent the best of what human beings are capable of. So let me say uh, live long and prosper right at this point and uh, wrap it up. I'll turn this back over to Nathan and see if there's any kinds of questions and see what you have to think. I want to thank you for your time, for being here this evening with us, uh, and I look forward to chatting with you. That is perfect. Oh, so many things. My mind hurts right now that I'm just <laughs> thinking about. So I think it's a great combination of recent research and some of the, the, the dialogues that have been created and just kind of contextually looking at some things that like, there was like two or three things that you said that I'm like, wow, I didn't even think about it looking at that way, but that is cool. profound. <laughs> so I think that's based on the questions coming in. That's what I'm getting for everybody too. So uh, guys in production, if we don't mind, if we can throw that Minty Meter slide up uh, one more time, just as a reminder for our audience, if that's okay. And we'll give them a second to get it up, but um, we want to hear from you all. We're already getting some questions coming in. So that's great. So feel free to send those through the YouTube chat. I'm kind of looking around, uh, getting questions all over the place, but uh, make sure uh, you can use your YouTube chat. You can use the Mintimeter QR code right here uh, from your mobile devices or type in www.minty.com with uh, code 2257-1005 to get us some questions. So we do have some coming in. I will say before I get to the questions, um, the October 11th thing, wow, that's creepy. I did yeah. not know that. Like that, yeah. like talk about fates aligning or whatever you may believe in this. But did you? Is that why you signed on tonight? Well, you know what? So this is. So I will say that this is contested in the Star Trek world. It's either October 9th or 11th, but one of those two days counts as what's called Federation Day, which is a holiday in the Star Trek world. It's not as big as First Contact Day, which is April 5th, but Federation Day is the day of the sort of signing of the Federation Charter that is the beginning of. Uh, the storyline for, uh, you know, this uh, multi-species federation to go out and uh, explore the universe together uh, using uh, their, their uh, technology and resources uh, in, the, in this part of the galaxy uh, to uh, find new ways to be human. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great sort of moment to mark, I think. Oh, that's awesome. No, I, I think that's it's so cool. I'm, I was like smiling the entire time when you're saying this. <laughs> um, okay, so definitely, oh, we got to definitely have some questions in. So to kick us off, um, one thing that I thought was interesting with your, um, with the last part, with the, the last quote, that one of the last quotes you've used, the acquisition of wealth piece. Um, mm-hmm. Just want to see if you want to comment a little bit more on it, because I found there a parallel between that acquisition of wealth, no longer the driving force, sort of paralleling some of the data from the youth that that you had referenced around maybe there's something beyond capitalism so i just didn't know if there's anything else that maybe you wanted to add to that because i think that that's that's fascinating because to me that sort of speaks the fact that the younger generations are starting to see some of those incongruencies with and it called the american dream call it whatever but like oh you could just pull yourself up and and, and make yourself a better person but that seems to be pretty incong- incongruent with some of the youth data that that you referenced Yeah, so, uh, and this is true in my experience, too, in my classes when I teach political philosophy, is that uh, for about 10 years now or so, uh, when I see folks who are roughly millennials and Gen Z in my classes, I've seen uh, a lot more expressions of frustrations with ideas like of the American dream that, that, uh, and this is particularly true after 2008-2009 with the, uh, the, the recession. But a lot of people experienced in their youth this kind of uh, feeling that they would never be able to come out ahead, uh, especially they would never have the opportunities of their parents or their grandparents. And for many people, student debt was one of these things that was just looming ahead of them, a feeling of something that they would never get out from under. 
And so a lot of them were expressing frustration with these kinds of economic realities, with the feeling of the rat race, but of, of accomplishing what. And a lot of people uh, I've seen, and it's, and it's mirrored in these surveys, uh, are asking questions about, well, what else is there? What can, what can be done? And I think that this partly explains, uh, in some sense, the great uh, youth support that uh, that went underneath the first uh, Bernie Sanders campaign uh, and continues to sort of create that kind of political fervor uh, amongst young people for uh, something different. Because if we also look at those kinds of surveys, a lot of these, a lot of young people don't trust that traditional political elites, either in the Democratic or the Republican Party, have their interests at heart. And so they want new ideas, they want new political leaders, uh, and they want to try new and innovative things. My, my, but the other point of that is that survey about dystopian stories is that a lot of the stories that are out there right now are ones that are one based on the surveys that tend to be able to encourage various kinds of extremism in the pursuit of social change. So I'm interested in the kinds of stories uh, that can help us to think about how do we make radical social change possible without having to burn everything to the ground or to uh, do that kind of political extreme kind of work. Um, in fact, things might have to radically change. And is how do we do that? What are our options out there? What is possible? And I think that a lot of young people are hungry and thirsty for this kind of uh, discussion. And I think that science fiction is a place in which many people can turn to, to help us think about the different kinds of parameters that are out there. And so I think Star Trek is one of these interesting places because in the future, as, as uh, Jean-Luc Picard points out, there is no money and there is no working for a wage, right? On Earth, at least, Star Trek, the Star Trek universe is one in which people, you know, if they work, they do so for their own benefit. We see this, for instance, in uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, uh, Joseph Sisko, uh, uh, Benjamin Sisko's dad, has a restaurant in um, in uh, New Orleans, he has people that work there. Um, are they getting paid? Is he making money? Well, if there's no money in the Federation, then how is this all working? Jean-Luc Picard has uh, a winery in France. Uh, a lot of it is automated, it appears, but like, so people are working, but what's the relationship there? And I think that this starts to raise questions, at least from my mind, what I talk about in the book is, you know, what is the connection between earning a wage and work? And it is always, is it always necessary to imagine working for a wage? What are alternatives of work that don't involve wages? And there's been a lot of social theory in the United States going back all the way to W.B. Du Bois and other folks who have talked about what is that connection between work and wages? Is it a necessary connection? Can you imagine work in other ways? Can work have different roles in our lives other than just simply for wages for survival? And I think that that starts to really open up different kinds of possibilities about what does it mean to study, to train, to gain skills and to work? And so I think Star Trek can start, you know, that world that's so perfect out there where no one works for a wage, what would that mean? What would it mean to accomplish it? What would we have to do here now in order to reach that? No, it's not, it's super fascinating. That's, wow. Oh, you're making my head hurt. Stop this. It's Monday already. <laughs> like in a good way. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, Okay, lots of things coming in. So everybody bear with me as I'm, I'm, I'm going through these. So I think we started talking about this a little bit with the, the role of animals uh, mm. later on. Vulcans are vegetarians and later Riker says, we no longer enslave animals for food. Do you consider animal rights ideals along with your other social justice subjects? Why or why not? I do. I mean, I think that this is part of the chapter that I have about uh, animals in the natural world. I think that part of what uh, Star Trek encourages is encourages us to think about is that in order to make changes uh, uh, about social justice and social change in the world, we're going to have to rethink the role of nature as resources and animals as resources in our sphere of existence. And what would that mean? 
And there's a variety of different kinds of episodes and movies in which, right, uh, uh, the animal world, the natural world is uh, discussed and, uh, you know, what does it mean to conserve, to protect natural resources? But I think the really radical stuff that comes out of Star Trek is when it talks about the ways in which animals are partners in human or federation multi-species life and so uh this uh, this idea right of of food uh animals for food well um you know it's the case that part of what allows uh the star trek world to be such a uh, utopia is that they have the what they call replicator technology so you can replicate matter into any kind of other matter that you like and so if you want a steak you can make a steak but it actually really doesn't come from an animal it's other matter that was reconstituted to appear in the form of a steak uh and so uh you no longer have that connection of having to use animals for food in that way if you have uh if you have that kind of technology and i think that this raises some interesting questions because there's a lot of people starting to wonder about now is it possible for instance to uh you know uh uh 3d print meat Right, uh, lab-grown meat uh, that would not be connected to animals. What would that be like uh, for food production, right? And so I think that what Star Trek starts to get us again, what Star Trek gets us to think about is that the way in which they live their life uh, with replicator technology, with no uh, money, with faster than light uh, uh, space travel, what would it take to from, from for us to get here from where we are to that? That's the sort of main thrust of the book is to sort of think about like what changes might we have to take in order to get to a world like that? And it would mean a reconceptualization of so many things that we take for granted, so many assumptions that we have about our world and the way that's proper to live. And I think that one of these is the ways in which we think about the natural world as a resource uh, and how we might think about how we start to work to think about the natural world, not as a resource, but as a partner that we live in and amongst. And what I do in the book is show that there are numerous social movements around the world that are urging us to do this, urging us to think about the natural world in this way. And particularly what I talk about in the book is uh, the movement to give nature a legal voice We've seen this in places like Ecuador and Bolivia, and in some in cases in the United States too. Movements that have, what, what they've tried to do is to, in the constitution in Bolivia, for instance, in Ecuador, is to give quote unquote, mother nature a legal voice in decisions about development. And so according to the Bolivian and Ecuadorian constitutions, whenever there are major uh, development projects being envisioned by some corporation, uh, some of the environmental impact studies that have to be done must include a representative of mother nature in those decisions. And the representative of mother nature is to decide whether or not the changes that are being proposed would affect the ecosystems in some way that make it impossible for those systems to continue and to be sustainable. And so I think that in some senses, we're on a, uh, we're on the edge of a real interesting revolution in consciousness about the natural world that is reflected in these kinds of movements where we're thinking of the natural world, not simply as things that we can use for our own benefit, but recognizing that maybe we need to recognize the inherent agency and the independence and the autonomy of the natural world that doesn't always align with our human interests. And there's numerous Star Trek stories in which there's a conflict like that portrayed. And I think that Star Trek can be useful in thinking about those kinds of conflicts. And kind of on that same note, um, one of the questions that came in is, so can you discuss the stark differences between the original Star Trek series and the next generation on how interspecies problems are resolved? Hmm. Well, I guess I'd have to hear about more of the, uh, uh, the, the background of uh, what, they, what they see the differences are. Um, I mean, of course, right, uh, Star Trek, the original series ended after a three-year run that started in 1966. Mm -hmm. 
And it was not particularly successful as a show. It was more successful in its reruns. And then uh, Gene Roddenberry and a lot of these folks languished in this weird kind of like hell in between uh, 66 and the 70s, where science fiction was not really picked up very much until Star Wars came along. And then Star Wars sort of really sparked interest in, in different kinds of stories. And Star Trek decided to jump on board with that. The next generation was uh, uh, Gene Roddenberry was still around at that time. And it was his attempt to reboot the storytelling to try to show the world in its most perfect kind of utopia, right? And so I think that for uh, one way to maybe characterize it is that Star Trek, the original series, was the, was the, the, the series, I think, that perhaps represented Roddenberry's uh, compromises with NBC executives about the kinds of stories that he wanted to tell. Uh, but the next generation was really much more of his vision of a conflict-free world where everyone got along and, uh, uh, you know, there was plenty everywhere. Um, and quite frankly, the first couple of seasons of The Next Generation are not very good uh, because I think that um, uh, it's hard for us, I think, to see and understand where that kind of world comes from. And so I agree with my students that there are sometimes some kinds of disconnect between our world and the Star Trek world. But I think that if we can build in those kinds of, we can build in the, that ladder to sort of see that that kind of perfection that you see on the Enterprise D in Star Trek The Next Generation is the result of so much suffering, of so much death genocide, nuclear war, all these kinds of things is that they decided in the future that they want to live in a much different way so that those problems don't come back to haunt us. And so I think that uh, part of the next generation is really much more trying to capture that spirit that Roddenberry wanted uh, with Star Trek of the, the perfect world that has come out of, utop uh, out of dystopia. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, not necessarily a question, but I'm going to hit two of these real quick. Um, everybody that doesn't know all of these presentations, um, the YouTube link that you're currently watching um, will be open or up when we're done. So feel free to share this. Um, we'll do some post recording things uh, in the studio to kind of get it all, all set up. But yeah, this presentation will be available uh, in uh, forever <laughs> until we take it down off the channel. So you definitely have a, the opportunity to share this amongst other people. And I encourage you to do so um, as with all of ours. Um, additionally, there was a kind of a shout out again towards the title of the book. And what I wanted to do is kind of take a little bit more time and see if there was uh, any other concepts or like, I guess, teasers, if you will, because I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the book. Uh, the book will uh, is entitled Star Trek's Philosophy of Peace and Justice. And again, that will be out in February 2022. And not that I'm necessarily don't try to do book promotion, but I think it's a super, super important work that you do. No, um, thanks. Is there, <laughs> is there is there anything else that like, as far as maybe a concept that we haven't dabbed into a whole lot tonight, uh, that maybe you hit in the book that might be particularly interesting for our viewers tonight? Yeah, I mean, one of the, the very first chapters, uh, this is something, I mean, this is a, a big sci-fi uh, uh, story that I think that comes out a lot uh, in stuff that we're, uh, that we talk about in uh, pop culture today. Human nature, what is it? And so, in fact, I was just, we were just talking about this in my uh, uh, Star Trek class last week. Uh, writers for, you know, hundreds of years have said that crises like global pandemics are opportunities, uh, really tragic opportunities that get us to see what human beings are really like. That these crises moments are ones in which human nature is revealed. So Albert Camus in The Plague uses the plague as a setting for that kind of a story. But you know, you see this in lots of different stories. Uh, um, uh, the Walking Dead, a zombie story, right? That's is this is really a story about humanity in the face of some kind of viral catastrophe. Uh, Lord of the Flies, that classic story of the little kids put on the island, right? What is human nature once you take away authority and government? So there's all these kinds of stories about, you know, uh, crises and and what does it what is what do they say about who we are? And I think that uh, what I do in part of the book is examine the, what Star Trek has to say about human nature. And there's many different episodes throughout all of the different series, 800 different uh, episodes over 55 years, right, that examine crises like these and what they bring out in people. And what Star Trek always tries to show is that, uh, yes, it is possible that crises bring out the worst in us, that they make us fearful, they make us scared, they make us dangerous, they make us savage, they make us violent. This is all possible. 
But Star Trek tries to tell oftentimes very different stories that we also have the capacity to be compassionate, to be cooperative, and most importantly, to be rational and to think about how we can solve problems together using the resources that we all represent together. And so I think that part of what the first few chapters are trying to figure out what is human nature and what's our best evidence as to whether we are inherently violent or whether we are inherently cooperative and rational. And what I end up saying is that I think that Star Trek really hones in on the idea that uh, the story of us being violent and savage and aggressive and self-interested is overplayed, is that yes, we can be those kinds of people, but it depends on the world that we build. If we build a world that emphasizes and encourages those kinds of qualities and traits, well, then a lot of people will act in those kinds of ways. It's a self-reinforcing loop. But if we build a world that encourages people to be rational, to be compassionate, to be ethical with one another, that's the kind of world that we'll get. And I think that there's a lot of sort of archaeological and anthropological evidence that suggests that for the time that human beings have lived here on this earth, right? So human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens have, uh, you know, the estimate is somewhere about 300,000 years. The time period that we have the best archaeological evidence of warfare, of slavery, of these kinds of awful things only goes back maybe, maybe somewhere between 10,000 to 14,000 years, right? That's the best archaeological evidence that we have of warfare, of these kinds of activities. But we have archaeological evidence and forensic evidence of human beings and human communities going back tens of thousands of years before that without evidence of mass violence, of, of warfare, of mass graves, and things like that, that stuff does start to appear more and more about 10,000 years ago. And so what's interesting about this is to suggest is that maybe all the things that things like Lord of the Flies and, you know, these stories that emphasize to us that we're going to be just savage upon one another if all hell breaks loose and the government falls apart, I think that uh, history tells us, the, his, the story of humanity tells us that that kind of human being has maybe only really been here for about 10,000 years, maybe about 10% of the whole human story. And maybe there's more to us than just that 10,000 years. And so if things have not always been the way they are, that means that they can be different. And so if the past is different than the present, that means that the future can be different from the present. And that means that we have to start thinking about how can we build a different future? That's where science fiction and particularly stories like Star Trek can be useful for helping us to imagine a world that is different so that we don't get locked into thinking that we as human beings can only be one kind of thing and that the story of humanity is one that is doomed because that story is all over the place as we see lots of young people already believe that um what do we do as educators too that's the other thing i think is interesting is that a lot of these surveys are selling us we're not getting what we think is necessary from our educations in the university that can help us to address these problems and so i think there's a failure on the part of society there's a failure on the part of political leaders and there's a failure on the part of educational institutions at least in the united states to helping students be able to imagine a world that's different than one that's awful and destructive we have failed in some sense as parents, as leaders, and as society to provide hope for young people. And that's a shame. And that, and that, that hope is such, such a powerful piece, uh, as you were kind of demonstrating tonight. Um, one thing that one of the audience members is asking about, too, is this concept of kind of civics and politics and, and levels of engagement um, with our within our society. So to achieve a society defined by compassion, science, and democracy, it seems that we need to get most people engaged in civics and politics. How do we, given so much uh, kind of corporate control or wealth um, of government, media, kind of these big conglomerates, whatever that might be, how do we do that kind of in our current system and can we? Yeah, I think we can, we must. I'll put it this way, we must and we can, and we've seen that it's possible. Uh, and I think that we can see this from the work of one of the greatest Trekkies around, Martin Luther King Jr. Right, as I mentioned before, he was deeply inspired by the work of Star Trek, but he was deeply inspired by science fiction in general, right? So a story that I often tell, I'll try to uh, do this quickly, is when he was, uh, when he was in his 20s, when he was dating uh, Coretta Scott, uh, uh, 
they had a first date and he asked her if he could have a second date with her. And she eventually, of course, became his wife, Crud Stop King. And she knew he had a reputation of, of sort of being a very handsome and well-spoken young man. So she wanted to make sure that this was worthwhile. So she said, look, you can have a second date with me if you read this book and read the whole book and then write me a letter and tell me what you think about it. And then afterwards, maybe I'll have a second date with you. And he was like, okay, he gave, she gave him this book and the book was called Looking, uh, Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. And the book is a science fiction story of a man that falls asleep in the late 19th century and wakes up in the 20th century in the United States. And he sort of discusses how things have changed. And the government is entirely different. It's a, a sort of a, a democratic socialist government in the United States. There's free health care, there's free education, and all these kinds of things, all these different kinds of changes. And so... Um, uh, Dr. King read this book and he wrote a letter, which you can find in the King archives, where he told her, look, I'm really glad that you gave me this book. Uh, it's so inspiring. I think that I want to devote my career and my pastoring to building the kind of world that's depicted in this kind of book. And so he sent that letter to her. And of course, then they became married and the, the rest is history in some sense. But what is interesting is that, you know, I think that when we think about Dr. King, we think about someone who's very pragmatic, right? And all this kind of stuff. But think about that famous speech. I have a dream. I have a vision of a future. He was always talking about this future United States where things could be so much different in which so many things would be fulfilled. Prophecy would be fulfilled of justice, of fullness, of uh, human potential. And I think that a lot of this was not only nourished, of course, by his faith as a Christian, but also as a reader of science fiction. And he admitted that in many different kinds of ways in his life. And so towards the end of his life, he said, look, you know, we need to figure out as a country how we want to proceed going forward. And that means that we have to confront racism. We have to confront militarism and the huge military industrial complex that we have. We also have to confront materialism, wealth inequality. These, he said, are the triple evils of American society that if we don't fix, we are going to go to hell in a handbasket, right? The speech that he had in his pocket in Memphis when he died was why America may go to hell. So this is what he was thinking about towards the end of his life. And he was trying to figure out what are the ways in which we can build social movements to be able to confront those social evils. And I think that that's the kind of story that Gene Roddenberry was also concerned with telling is how do we overcome these kinds of social evils? And I think the answer that King gives is social movements. We need to organize. We need to organize in our schools, in our workplaces, and in society, build organizations to talk with our neighbors, to ask them, do you agree with this? Do you agree with the ways in which we have built power? And the civil rights movement, I think, was built out of people who were thinking about those ideas, and some of them at least got their ideas from science fiction. And so I think that uh, as we see with folks in Myanmar and Thailand and in Hong Kong, these kinds of stories have enormous power to rally people to, to work in solidarity with mother, to make social change against governments and economic systems that are oppressing them. And I think that we need to take these kinds of stories seriously. So Star Trek for me is more than just escapist fun. I mean, I love this stuff and I have tons of different kinds of uniforms. But first and foremost, my work is as someone who's interested in political philosophy and political activism. And I think that it's no mistake that and no coincidence that Dr. King was a Trekkie. I don't think so either. I just uh, uh, even more uh, deep thoughts on that one too. Like I just, that's just absolutely incredible. Um, one other thing that came up too, and actually this is one of the things that sparked for me in your, in your presentation. Uh, the question that comes through is since Terrans only escaped their own post-apocalyptic post hell via first contact, isn't that kind of a deus ex or an ex machina mm. way of solving our many problems? How does it offer us hope to solve problems by ourselves? And I guess for me, what this came up for was, is there sort of a parallel? Like maybe it's not a first contact, but is there a parallel in our world that makes sense of like, this is going to be our catalyst, um, I guess, in your opinion, uh, for where you think gets us to that point? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, actually. And I was really thinking about this beforehand, right? Because the story does seem to be like, oh, well, everything got better when we met the Vulcans because we built that warp technology, right? So it's really technology that changes things. And I think, I mean, there's a way of sort of thinking about that that's, that, that's the case. But I mean, I think that the story is more like this, is that what uh, Zephram Cochran did is he built this technology that got us noticed by the Vulcans. 
But as we see in the series Star Trek Enterprise that appeared in the early 2000s, this was before the formation of the Federation. It was hard going with the Vulcans, right? And so what I like about Enterprise, I know a lot of people don't like this series, and maybe I've never even heard about it, but I, I think it's a really fascinating series because it's the story of human beings trying to explore the universe and the struggles they have with this alien race that you know helped them to get beyond earth and it wasn't easy the vulcans were not easy people to get along with in fact they lied and they hid things because they thought that humans were not ready for uh this kind of exploration and so the story of enterprise in its four seasons was the story of humanity working toward the point of the establishment of the federation and so i think that uh, uh technology did get us a, a foot in the door so to speak but technology itself doesn't solve the problems of society it doesn't right you also need to develop various kinds of ways of cooperating negotiating and dealing with adversity uh, that are moral uh, ethical questions that are not solved by technology and so i mean i think that this is i think it is relevant to our sort of world today in which we talk about global climate change and the destruction of our ecosystems there are some people that say well look you know the answer is uh colonization of mars we have to start thinking about finding a way off of this planet because it's going to hell in a handbasket and i think that we have to be very wary of these kinds of solutions to these kinds of problems the elon musk sort of solution to global climate change is that uh technology right getting to mars right uh, one of my close friends is uh dr randall milstein here at the uh, osu nasa space grant and uh, he and I have talked extensively about this, is that it's uh, Earth is our home. We are meant to live here. We have to take care of this because there's no other place that we can live very easily or get to very easily. And so the idea is that technology is going to save us somehow, either on our planet or elsewhere, uh, is not true independent of some kind of also eth uh, ethical global consciousness about how we want to work together, how we're going to use our resources with one another, and how we're going to manage great global inequality. Uh, because right, the reality is, is that over half of human beings, 3 billion human beings on this planet live in deplorable conditions of poverty. Extreme poverty has been improved over the past 20 years, but it still means that somewhere between 700 million and a billion human beings live on less than about $30 per month of resources or the equivalent of that. And what I always ask my students is try to imagine you yourself living on somewhere between 30 to $70 to cover all of your housing, your medical needs, your food, clothing. Could you do that on say less than $40 a month? Could you do it less on $100 a month? And no one in, in the United States say they could do that. But the reality is, is that at least 700 to about a billion human beings live under those kinds of conditions each and every day on this planet. Many of them dying uh, from diseases that are entirely preventable, like malaria, even though now we're working to develop perhaps a, a malaria vaccine, which is really great news, right? But how have we allowed systems that allow that kind of suffering and death to exist on this planet. And that has to do with our global economic systems, our infrastructure right on the world. And how is it that eight human beings on the planet own about as much wealth as about 50% of the other, right? And so these are systems that we've created. And if we have created them, then we can change them too. How can we envision a different kind of world in which that kind of poverty and suffering doesn't exist? That's the kind of challenge I think that Star Trek imagine or you know gives to us because that's a world that they don't understand anymore. They have been able to work through all these problems to achieve something very different. How can we then think about how to overcome those problems to achieve a better future? And I think that that's really uh, the power of these kinds of stories is that it's that cognitive dissonance between the future that is portrayed and the reality that's lived. And then makes you wonder like, what's the space between those places and so i think that it's easy to imagine or many people want to say well you know technology will solve all these problems in some way or another uh, technology is very useful scientists are important but as linus pauling always said you can't divorce that from right moral questions about how do we use that technology and to what purposes is this technology going to 
Because if you don't ask those kinds of questions, then that technology can be used to reinforce oppression and injustice. And that's what he saw going on in his world, is that the work of scientists was being used not to improve the lives of human, lives of human beings, but to build more and more impressive weaponry. And that's why he spoke out. And that's what his uh, Nobel Peace Prize was about, was trying to confront that reality that technology by itself will not save us without also thinking about the ways in which we use and develop that technology. No, and I think that was a, a fantastic part in comment. We actually had a participant that had made that very comment that they had a family member during the Vietnam War area that was in computer science or something similar. And that was that moral question of, not wanting to separate, but sometimes it sounds like forced to, uh, can be terribly, terribly scary. So I think that that's a really, really good ending point kind of for this. And, and, and what a wonderful presentation. Again, I just thank, thank you so you. much for that. Um, what I want to say, first of all, is if you had some any additional parting comments before we head out tonight or anything you kind of want to leave the audience with. Well, uh, uh, I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, being here. I know that there's many different things that you could be doing this evening uh, and spending time with your family, watching football, uh, enjoying so many other different things. If you are here, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you for this. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, if you're not a Trekkie, that this may inspire you to think about uh, picking up the series. You can find a lot of these stuff. There, this is a renaissance in Star Trek right now. There's about three different new series that are being planned in production for all different kinds of ages. Uh, and so I think that this is a universe that has a lot of richness still to uh and creativity within it and, but i think that the sort of story dna of the star trek universe is this one of a hopeful future built by humanity that comes to a certain kind of moral maturity about mm -hmm. its goals its priorities and how it wants to use science and technology and it's not us they aren't us but part of the challenge is how could we become them and this is what I hope to be able to uh, explore both in my classes and in um, uh, my book. And so uh, if anyone ever has any questions about this or they want to continue with it, please go ahead and give me a, uh, uh, an email, give me a shout. And uh, I always love to talk about Star Trek. So uh, thank you, Nathan. I appreciate it. And to everyone, live long and long prosper. And prosper. <laughs> and we'll we'll keep you on a little bit here uh, right after we end production. But again, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. Big thanks for Dr. Roscoe's uh, time and not only prep and delivery of the presentation, but the amazing contributions to the academic community and beyond. Very much looking forward to the book. Check it out in February. As always, a very special shout out to our Connect Central Oregon team who have successfully been utilizing uh, this career training and intern program with us. And again, putting on another fantastic event. So thank them for their time and efforts there. And everybody, uh, again, just like to thank you. This concludes our Science Pub for Monday, October 11th, 2021. Um, also recognize again Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, so again, good job, Oregon, for, for making that official, this being our first celebration. So tell a friend about your experiences tonight. Be sure to share the presentation link, and we'll be sure to see you again next time, Beaver Nation, out there. Thanks again for participating, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>